Hello, my name is Timothy Wright, and I'm the National Curricula Coordinator here at the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. The National Building Museum is an independent, private nonprofit chartered by Congress in 1980. Our mission is to advance the quality of the built environment by educating people about its impact on their lives. The museum is located in Washington, D.C., just four blocks from the National Mall. We welcome visitors from around the world who come to engage with our exhibitions, learn something new at our educational programs, or attend one of our yearly festivals. Today, I'm going to give a brief introduction to one of our national educational programs, the Designing for Disaster Teaching Kit. I will give an overview of each lesson plan and preview a selection of activities from the kit. First, let's take a look at the materials included in the box. Here is the curriculum booklet. Inside are lesson plans, standards of learning, student worksheets, a teacher resource section, and a lot more. We'll cover some of the specific activities listed inside over the next few minutes. These poster-sized foldouts feature studies of resilient structures from around the world. And your students will use these photo investigation cards to complete a visual thinking strategy. This series of flood maps will guide students as they discuss the role of urban planning and land use. We're also providing some craft materials that students will use to complete the hands-on activities. For example, your students can use these pattern sheets when model building in Lesson 6. And finally, we're including three samples of actual, real building materials used to strengthen individual structures. There are three main goals of the Designing for Disaster program, and they are to introduce students to the people, processes, and choices involved in designing and constructing disaster-resilient communities, the second goal is to increase student awareness of the relationship between people and the built environment. And third, to increase student awareness of the relationship between the natural environment and the built environment and how those two are interdependent. The two main questions we're seeking to answer are, where should we build and how should we build? This program was created in the form of six lesson plans, ranging from 35 minutes to 75 minutes in length. The entire program requires about five hours of total instructional time. The six lesson plans should be completed in order, but are constructed in such a way that you can teach one per day or even one per week. In order to help your students begin answering these questions, we use our take on the design process as an educational framework. They will learn by doing. Your students will work together to define a problem, investigate solutions to that problem, generate new ideas, plan a feasible solution, which is often in the form of a prototype, produce an end product, and at each step, evaluate the outcomes. We have aligned this curriculum to the Common Core State Standards Initiative for English, Language Arts and Mathematics, the Next Generation Science Standards for Engineering Design, Earth Science, and Physical Science, as well as the National Standards of Learning and Technology, Geography, and Visual Arts. We consider the kit appropriate for students in grades 7 through 9, although we encourage teachers to adapt the program to fit their specific classroom needs. Let's talk a little more about the individual lesson plans. I'll touch on just a few key takeaways from each lesson while highlighting some of the hands-on activities as well. In lesson one, students will be asked to brainstorm a list of skills needed for problem solving, particularly in the realm of disaster mitigation. Disaster avoidance and mitigation are extensive and ongoing projects for many communities throughout the world. This education kit will focus on how designers, including engineers, can work together to create solutions to the problem of natural disasters. Lesson one will conclude with students recommending a list of needed skills, including teamwork, communication, analytical skills, and technical skills, including math and the sciences. During lesson two, the students will be introduced to structures and forces which act on them. In particular, you will be helping them understand two basic gravity loads, live load and dead load as well as demonstrating the forces of compression, tension, and shear. 
You can use your own classroom or another room in your school to demonstrate how and where these forces occur inside of real structural elements. The curriculum booklet also includes photographs and illustrations which will help your students to match the terminology to real life structures. The hands-on activity for Lesson 2 involves an open-ended assignment for students. After learning about compression, tension, and shear force, they will use a limited amount of materials in a quest to strengthen a wall. In this case, the wall will be represented by this square piece of chipboard, and the structural supports will be re represented by these craft sticks. These materials will be included in the kit. Students will work in teams to produce a design for a shear wall using only the materials provided, plus a little bit of glue. Here are some designs students have come up with in the past. The idea is not for the students to produce one specific design, but only to strengthen the wall. This is a fairly open-ended assignment, and success lies in increased structural integrity more so than it does with aesthetics. Lesson 3 shifts the focus to the actual effects of specific natural disasters on built structures. The scope of this program is limited, and that will only include scenarios for some types of natural disasters. Included will be discussions about earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, and storm surge. There are many other natural disasters that we will not address in this program, including drought, sinkholes, blizzards, volcanic eruptions, or landslides. The main activity in Lesson 3 involves using these photographs of buildings damaged by natural disasters. They illustrate how these historic natural disasters have affected homes and buildings. Students will work in groups as they describe what they see in the photographs. Then, using their existing knowledge about natural disasters, combined with visual clues in the photos, students will associate each photo with one type of natural disaster. This activity can and should act as a first step in researching historic natural disasters in a more comprehensive way. You can also alter the assignment to focus on events that have occurred in your part of the world. After their additional research, add a twist to this lesson by assigning students to present what they've learned to the rest of the class in the form of a television news report. Now, let's transition from learning about specific natural disasters to talk more broadly about what residents expect from their communities in order to live safely and comfortably. Lesson 4 is fairly extensive, and we've divided it into two sessions. Part 1 is all about land use. We want the students to think like city planners. They will consider how people use the land in any given town or city and learn to categorize individual structures into one of the five land use groups. First, you will work with your students to brainstorm a list of important, fundamental amenities a person would expect to have access to living in a town or city. The answers the students give will vary, but steer them toward broad, basic ideas such as safety, healthcare, housing, energy, transportation, or education, to name a few. After you've compiled a solid list, move on to discussing what building or infrastructure would support these needs. For example, for education, students might suggest a school. For energy source, they could suggest a power plant, for healthcare, a hospital, and so on. Then explain that each one of the listed buildings falls into a distinct land use category. The five categories are residential, institutional, commercial, industrial, and open or public space. For example, a house would be categorized as residential use, a school would be categorized as institutional, and a power plant would be described as industrial. Part two of this lesson will build on the land use activity. With some knowledge about how to categorize buildings, you can move on to a new discussion about where to build, with a strong consideration as to how, as humans, we are affected by the natural environment. Your students will use this series of maps to replan the fictional town of Greenville. This map of Greenville is coded with the same land use terminology from part one of this lesson. During this activity, your students will discuss the concept of risk, specifically linked to the flooding in the town of Greenville. Use the flood maps to guide this discussion. There are also prompts in the curriculum booklet to tie this discussion to your own community. We estimate that Lesson 4 will take an hour and 15 minutes to complete. However, the role-playing, debate, and reflection over land use and zoning can be expansive. You may need to extend the time allotted for these engaging discussions. 
After planning for floods in the fictional town of Greenville, we will move on to studying actual, real-world structures and materials in Lesson 5. Lesson 5 offers a small window into the world of sustainable and resilient building techniques. We've included profiles of buildings and infrastructure from around the world. Your students will study buildings as small as a single-family home and as large as a commercial skyscraper. Break students into groups so they can become experts on one structure, then jigsaw them into mixed groups to share what they've learned. We're also including hands-on, real construction materials for students to handle and examine. There is a roof tie-down to strengthen the connection between a roof truss and walls of a home. And here's a small section of impact-resistant structural glass. It's many times stronger than a conventional plate glass window, and is actually a system in and of itself, with several layers making up each piece. And we've also included these specifically designed nails used in home construction. Extra features like these raised rings near the top that help keep the nail from slipping away from or out of the piece of wood during a shaking event like an earthquake or hurricane. When handling the construction materials, remind your students to take care. In the final lesson, your students will be asked to build a conceptual model using all the knowledge they've gained about structural forces, risk, land use, resilient building techniques, and materials. The outcome should be a model building with at least one representation of a mitigation technique. For example, we can use the shear wall from Lesson 2, or your students can take a cue from the building cards in Lesson 5 and construct an elevated building or a facade that includes a moment frame. We're including 10 4x4 inch boxes and pattern sheets to get you started on the model building process. You can supplement these with everyday classroom craft materials or ask students to bring in recyclable items from home. Well, thanks for your time and thanks for watching. This concludes our introduction to the Designing for Disaster Teaching Kit. To learn more about the kit and other educational materials for teachers, visit our website, www.nbm.org.